hello again. There was a good deal of sensitivity after the end of the Second World War about the use of the expression concentration camp. It tended to sum up images of Belsen and Dachau, later Auschwitz. Nevertheless, the British were still keen to use concentration camps whenever they could get away with it, but they went out of their way not to allow these places to be called concentration camps. They were fighting some fairly fierce colonial wars in the 1950s in Kenya and Malaya, and on both uh, occasions they used concentration camps. They, millions of people were imprisoned in them, but these places were never actually described as concentration camps. The camps full of Jews in Cyprus were concentration camps in all but name, and so were the ones where the uh, Mau Mau were detained in the 1950s. The best example of this studied avoidance of calling things by their right name occurred in Southeast Asia. I think we all know that uh, British used concentration camps in South Africa. It was a very effective technique. It stopped people from uh, fraternising with the guerrillas and supplying them. And when Britain was fighting a civil war in Malaya in the 1950s, they had the same problem. The Chinese population there were aiding the guerrillas. And so the British decided it would be a good idea to lock up hundreds of thousands of people behind barbed wire to stop them offering aid to the guerrilla army fighting against them. Half a million Chinese villagers kept behind barbed wire in the 1950s in Malaya with armed guards patrolling the perimeters of the camp. Instead of calling the sites concentration camps, the British designated them as new villages. It was a brilliant propaganda coup. Simply by avoiding talk of concentration camps, the British were able to set up and run a network consisting of 450 concentration camps, and nobody batted an eyelid. Terminology was everything, and as long as everybody stuck to the convention of calling these compounds new villages, it appeared that nobody other than the Chinese prisoners themselves would raise any objection. Not only that, but the brutal campaign of suppression mounted by the British army against the Chinese in Malaya is remembered today as an example of a humane operation, best summed up by the phrase coined by the governor of the country, who was a ruthless military man. We remember Malaya today for the expression, hearts and minds. The Americans later used this phrase, of course, but it was a British invention. When the Japanese invaded uh, countries such as Indochina and Malaya, the only people who fought tenaciously against the occupations were not the colonial British and French forces, but the indigenous inhabitants themselves. It was often the Chinese who organised uh, resistance and it was the Communist Party that was most efficient at um, marshalling forces against Japanese occupation to these nations. The British were a bit slow to react to what Harold Macmillan later referred to as the wind of change, and they tried to hang on to their territories uh, in Southeast Asia. The French tried to hang on to Vietnam, until, of course, the uh, siege of the NBN Phu, after which they abandoned title to Indochina, and the British tried their best to hang on to Malaya as well. The rubber plantations there and the tin mines were very valuable. In fact, they regarded them as vital to their interests. We had abandoned India, but we thought it might just be possible to hang on to Malaya if only we could keep the Chinese uh, suppressed. The war in Malaya is another beautiful example of British circumlocution. It was never described as a war, but as an emergency. The Malayan emergency was officially known as. <laughs>
just like the troubles in Northern Ireland. This is the British all over. They've always had a way with words like that. They were bombing uh, jungle using defoliants like Agent Orange, but it was never technically a war. The idea was that to deal with the insurgency, they built new camps for Chinese people to live in, and they herded the Chinese into these camps, surrounded them with barbed wire, and then burned down their old villages. This is actually a war crime. Um, it's specifically prohibited by the Geneva Convention to destroy property in that way and deport whole populations. But the British thought that they could get away with it. They were also hanging people for things such as soliciting contributions for the Communist Party, carried the death penalty in Malaya, and people were executed for doing so. From 1951 onward, the uh, British rounded up 120,000 Chinese people from various villages, uprooted them from their homes, and sent them to these new compounds. That was just for starters. In the end, over half a million were detained in that way. The villages would be surrounded by British troops, and then the people would be driven from their homes, loaded onto lorries, their old homes burned down, and the British uh, built them brand new accommodation, the new villages. The only difference was that these were villages surrounded by barbed wire fences and there were watchtowers and the army guarded them to check who was coming in and out. No one was under any illusion at all that these places were actually concentration camps. It didn't work ultimately the mood had changed. The British could get away with stuff like this in the early part of the 20th century. They couldn't get away with it for long after the war. So although the Malayan emergency went on for years, ultimately Britain had to withdraw, just as it withdrawn from everywhere else, like India and Israel and so on. It was almost the last use of concentration camps on the part of the British. It's a slightly debatable point because some people would classify the uh, camps that were used when internment was introduced in Northern Ireland as concentration camps. But certainly the uh, Malayan camps fell into that category. I just thought I'd talk about this because it's a particular interest of mine.